Hello and welcome to the Pinnacle Podcast, brought to you by Pinnacle.com, the online bookmaker that offers you the best odds, the highest limits and a unique winner's welcome policy. I'm your host Ben Cronin and today I'm joined by a man who's well known in professional poker and sports betting circles. He's co-authored one of the biggest betting books out there at the moment. It's Ed Miller. Hey, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm um, great, thank you. Cool. Um, I feel like we've got a lot to talk about today, um, but I think it will benefit those listening to hear a little bit more about your background and kind of how you ended up becoming an author and, and working on the industry side of betting. So where did your sports betting journey begin? Uh, I actually started in sports not too long ago with um, when the daily fantasy stuff began uh, really taking off here in the U.S. Uh, around 2015. Um I'd been in poker for a long time before then, wrote some books, play, played for a living for a while, and um, and I, uh, when I saw the daily fantasy stuff take off, I immediately kind of identified that as a gambling opportunity, <laughs> you know, um, just it has to do with kind of the structure of how that game works. And so I pretty much jumped into that full force, and uh, that went well, and I ended up reconnecting with Matt, who I'd known for a long time, but um, hadn't really worked with before. And uh, we started working on sports stuff. So been been working more on the sports side ever since then. And so how long were you, I mean, obviously, the, the poker background is quite extensive. How long were you involved in poker? And to what kind of level were you competing at? Um, so I, I really just, uh, my attitude about poker was always just, uh, I enjoyed the game. I thought it was a good way to you know, it was kind of appealing to me to play a game for a living, <laughs> I guess. Um, so that was that was um, my attitude toward it. So I mostly played cash games. I played what I would call mid-stakes cash games. Um, and uh, every time I took a look at the high-limit world, it, <clears throat> it definitely didn't suit my personality. It was a little bit high-pressure and a little bit dealing with... Um, you know, I just you know, didn't want the swings, didn't want some of the relationships that people have, you know, in that world, it's kind of a, you know, a smaller world. So I, I tended to try to stick to the mid stakes world and keep it calm. And I mean, kind of enjoying success in, in the poker industry or the sports betting industry, I'm, I'm assuming going back to, to your education, was there some kind of connection there that, that helped you be a success? I don't know how directly my education <laughs> Uh, contributed to to the poker and gambling stuff. Um, I, you know, I ended up. Uh, I mean, it's definitely related fields. Obviously, math and and um, you know, critical thinking. I think logic. I think I think logic probably plays more into gambling than than people give it credit for. Um, and but you know, my my education specifically. I mean, I got a computer science degree and a physics degree and. You know, I, I don't think I specifically use those disciplines very often in, in at least the poker stuff. But um, definitely just in, in terms of thinking logically and rigorously about things, for sure. And then just kind of touching upon the, the sports betting side, you're still, it's still relatively new per se. Are you able to, to go into any details about these viable betting opportunities that you found and kind of attracted you to the industry? I haven't really done much sports betting myself that's actually you know not what i've been doing so i uh played dfs for a while so i did that on the betting side and then basically matt and i decided shortly thereafter that we would try to build in-play models for the american sports because you know we we basically saw that as um i i don't want to say that we foresaw the the supreme court decision and everything that's happened you know in the last year in the united states um, cause we didn't, I mean, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but you know, we, we kind of had the idea that this was something that, that, that kind of wasn't, wasn't built. And then if we built it, that it would, uh, be useful in some, in some way. So that's really what, what I've been working on. You know, after we, we kind of gave the fantasy a good run until they started, they started having, you know, their own problems. And I kind of saw the writing, what I thought was the writing on the wall there and, and, and kind of pivoted to, the the in play stuff. So we've been working on. So I've been building models. I've been writing code and building models for the last couple of years. 
You kind of, so you mentioned um, Matt there, and I think it's, uh, we should just get on to the book. And I mean, I've got to say, I love the book. I've read a fair few in my time, but it, it really kind of hit the nail on the head when it cover, comes to covering those basics components of betting. I guess the, the clue is in the title, really, and it, it approaches betting from a, a very logical point of view. But with you and Matt, what was kind of the relationship there? And you said about like you had a bit of previous history before the book started writing. So so what happened there? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I met Matt, you know, 15 more years ago here in Las Vegas. He We were both playing poker uh, at the time. Um, and I think probably the first time I met Matt, he asked me to sign my first poker book, which was, you know, eons ago. So, um, you know, he, he kind of got into sports earlier than I did. Um, and as I say, we kind of reconnected over the fantasy sports. We both were doing that, you know, roughly the same strategy, you know, uh, developed, I guess, separately. And then we realized that we were doing the same thing and that and that we should probably team up um so you know and 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 that's when that's when i kind of i started learning more about the sports gambling world and uh you know the reason we wrote the book i would say is because so the book's called the logic of sports betting and and what was really the impetus for for me is that i saw you know i see a lot i i follow you know I'm, i'm active on twitter uh, and I follow a lot of what people have to say about gambling. I followed, you know, how things were developing in the United States. And, and I saw, you know, what, in my opinion, were a lot of kind of logical fallacies uh, about sports betting and about um, sports gambling, kind of making, kind of getting into the, the general discussion about sports betting, you know. And, and, and frankly, I saw it getting up to you know, legislators or, or decision makers, people who are going to make decisions about how sports betting was going to develop in the United States. And, you know, I said, well, let's let's try to fight some of this min- misinformation. Let's try to, you know, write a book that, in my opinion, will educate people and give people, you know, everyone kind of a basic grounding in, in how all this stuff actually works. You know, and, and my hope is that, you know, the book's written for, you know, from a gambler's perspective. So it's written from the perspective, well, I want to, I want to be a better sports better. I want to maybe try to make some money doing this. You know, what are the things I need to know and what are the things I need to think about, you know, and it's not um, an exclusive list. It's, it's hard, you know, as far as being a professional better, you know, it takes a lot of skills and, and we don't aim to cover all that in the book, but we do say basically everything in the book. We think you do have to know if you want to be a good better. Um, and, but it's also written, it's not just written, even though it's written for a better perspective, it's, it's, it's intended really to educate anyone who wants to uh, interact with the industry, whether you are on the operator side or whether you are, you know, a, a, a regulator or a legislator or a, a lobbyist or, uh, you know, anyone who's going to engage with the industry, really, you know, we think this is the book really gives you you know, hits all the high points about what you need to know about how everything works. Yeah, I mean, I think the the beauty of it's really in the simplicity. I mean, I can certainly speak from experience and trying to trying to articulate some some often complex subject matter in something that's easy to digest is a, a very hard task indeed. I just I'd be interested to know if you're you're co-authoring the book. Was there was it an easy ride? Did you agree on everything, or was there kind of some some arguments about what should be included, what shouldn't be included. It's it's funny because we actually started uh, the book concept uh, last year, and we were going to write a, a pretty different book. Actually, we were going to write a book about about modeling. You know, since that's what I do every day when I walk into the office, as I sit down and and work on models. So, you know, that was sort of the idea. Well, let's write a book about modeling, and then and then you know we wrote, I would say, a third of a book. And and then we realized, you know what? I don't I don't think this would be interesting to very many people. <laughs> you know, I the people it would be interesting to, I think possibly it would be very interesting to. But but you know, I we decided we didn't want to spend you know really a substantial amount of time and effort to to finish a book that that honestly not that many people would get much out of. So we kind of we kind of we kind of redirected there, and I think I think that experience is what gave us a lot of clue about what to put in and not to put into the book. So 
really most of the content I think we agreed on, except, you know, around the edges, there's one or two chapters in there that I wrote that Matt, that Matt isn't the fondest of, but he ended up saying, you know what, let's just put it in. It's better to have it than not. So, um, but, but yeah, that was, I would say the process. I'd love to know what those chapters were, but I think we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> Matt's, Matt's got a, a fairly kind of a wealth of experience specific to sports betting, hasn't he? So did you find that, and I best the guess this kind of goes both ways, did you find yourself learning a lot from Matt during that process of writing the book? And, and similarly, did you find yourself teaching him things that perhaps he didn't know? I, I don't know how much I've taught Matt. I mean... <laughs> he's he's an extremely smart guy and he's got a ton of experience and he he's just one of the you know one of the sharpest people i've ever met in this uh arena um you know over the years i've been working with him he's taught me just just an absolute ton i mean as i said i i really had done nothing in sports betting at all until 2015 and i started with dfs and my you know my dfs strategy was really very simple um and uh you know, and, and, and so really in those three or four years, everything that's in the book and everything and beyond, you know, including the modeling stuff and everything. I mean, I mean, if I'm fair, really, he's taught me all of it. Um, and so, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's just been a pleasure to learn so much. And and, you know, I don't know. I mean, he says I've taught him something. I, I don't think I've actually taught him anything. I think I think sometimes, you know, the process of writing the book helped clarify some of what's important, you know, I think, I think sometimes when you, when you get in the weeds and build models and set sports and, you know, th there's a tendency to, to get, uh, I guess a little bit arrogant about your, your work, you know, where, where you built this model and you're like, you know what, I think this model is awesome. And, and we certainly think that about a lot of what we built, but then, you know, sometimes, you know, if you think your model's so good, you, you don't work as hard to do things like, you know, line shop and 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 you know you get a little bit lax about you know making sure that you are you know betting into what we call in the book we call synthetic zero synthetic hold markets where basically you're you know scalps or or almost scalps you know really most of your betting should be into markets where basically you can bet either side with almost no you know big on either side if you want to win and um, and you do that by basically comparing, uh, you know, two two or more lines, two or more operators, and finding markets where you know you can get minus one fifty on one side and plus one forty nine on the other, you know, maybe or plus one forty eight. And then so those are really the markets if you bet into those and you have a good model, that's really where you can win. And I think you know sometimes when you build a good model, you you start to let that second part go lax a little bit. You start betting into situations that that aren't as good um, because, you know, you think your stuff is so great. And, you know, and, and I think, I think honestly, you know, that the math in the end doesn't lie. And, and, and if you, you know, get lazy about some of that stuff, you won't do as well. So, uh, so maybe I think some of the writing process helped to kind of recenter Matt, you know, in, in that perspective, but um, yeah, I don't know. Those are my thoughts. <laughs> and, and as someone, who, as you've you've already said, you you you're a modeler by trade, and that's what you do day to day. So when you're when you're writing this book, did you find it difficult to kind of rein it in and not go too beyond those that complexities and the sticking to the the simple kind of um, instructional format that you followed? You already said you were kind of halfway or a third of the way through another book. So how did you kind of stop yourself getting into that? that kind of flow of the, the modeling and, and going down that rabbit hole. Right. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean the book we write, you know, and again, so it's, it's called the logic of sports betting and we really wanted, you know, the, the audience or, or, or really the, we wanted to make the book about what you can, the, the concepts that you can understand logically about how all this stuff works. Basically, you know, we wanted it to be accessible to people who, you know, aren't about to download, you know, Anaconda and start, you know, writing Python code and, you know, pulling data sets and, you know, doing machine learning and, and, and all that stuff. I mean, I mean, we, you know, the audience is really not that person. Frankly, that's, 
you know, 90, 98% of people who are involved in, you know, in sports betting aren't, aren't, are never going to do any of that stuff, you know, honestly, you know, and, you know, though they may find it interesting, you know, from a theoretical perspective, as far as like a hands-on instructional thing, it really doesn't offer much value. So, you know, we said, well, we want to, we want to tell you everything, you know, if you're one of the 98% of people, what can we tell you that's worthwhile? What can we tell you that, a is going to help you bet better, and but B is really just going to help you understand it all better and 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 make everything click into place. So every time, every time you know, I wrote something that kind of wasn't wasn't aimed at the ninety eight percent. You know, wasn't really about the logic of sports betting. Was more about like the the in the weeds stuff. You know, we it, it, some of that did get cut. You know, and and I have to say it's a little bit. You know, and this was one of this was one of Matt's. It, I don't want to say concerns, but this was this was the fine line that we walked with the book was, you know, we both very clearly knew, you know, kind of the topics we wanted to cover. But, you know, it's unfair to the reader to claim that that's enough to go and, you know, win at sports betting, really, because because, you know, I wouldn't try to win without models. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't. I mean, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's really um you know, I think you can pick stuff off here and there, you know, if you if you don't have models. But I think if you want to be a, a serious winner at sports betting, I, I think, you know, you need to you need to get some data sets and you need to, you know, build models and work on models. And, you know, a lot of the stuff we talk about that and, and, and that those are some of the sections that Matt was the the on the edge about were the sections where we talk about, you know, how to win in in, in markets like prop markets or other markets you know, where you're taking kind of a qualitative approach to winning rather than a quantitative one. And because that approach really only takes you so far. So, um, so that was the line we walked in the book. Maybe we'll write this modeling book at some point and then the two will go together and then, and then it'll be a little bit more of a complete package. On the other hand, I mean, some other people have written stuff about modeling and I don't think, you know, necessarily we have to be the, the names on the book <laughs> at all you know, information is information. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that was my, you know, we, we kind of tried to walk this line of let's keep the book accessible. Let's keep it interesting to, to the vast majority of people who are into sports betting. Let's try to give everybody something of value and, and, you know, let's explicitly try to stay out of the weeds a little bit. From my point of view, I mean, I've, I've already said, I can't, I can't speak highly enough of it. And you look on Twitter and, Everyone's kind of raving about it, but from the perspective of the person that wrote the book and, and you and Matt have obviously talked about this, is how has it been received in your eyes? Do you think it's kind of succeeded in in changing the way people think about betting? I mean, the book's been out a month, so I don't know. I don't know how much it's changed people's opinion. I'm 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 really happy with what we came up with. I, I you know I kind of as we were reading through the finished product. You know, I was I really was like, you know what, this is exactly the book we tried to write. So that's the first feeling I have about it is is that I, I do feel like we wrote the book we were trying to write. And I mean, I mean, what can I say? I mean, the book sold extremely well, sold two or three times more than I expected it to so far. So that's good. And then, um, yeah, I mean, it, it does seem to be resonating with people on Twitter. You know, I the the people people are the things people are saying about it are exactly what I kind of had hoped people would say about it, which is what you've said that it it's 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 it, we really tried to make it very accessible and tried to we tried to make it really like a primer on like you know before before you do anything in sports betting, just read these two hundred and fifty pages. It'll take you a few hours, and like you'll be so much better off. Like we're we're cutting off the learning curve or whatever it is and and that's really the feedback we've been getting about the book so i mean yeah i, I can't say I, i've been super happy about how it's been received so far we want people to to go out and buy the book but there's there's a couple of things i just want to kind of discuss in a little bit more detail i don't want to i don't want to give too much away um the the first for me is your one that th I think is very important is your distinction between the types of bookmakers and you talk about the market maker and the the retail sports book. So, if we were to kind of imagine someone listening to this that 
assumes all bookmakers are one and the same. How would you then explain to them the difference between the two? The, the intro to that chapter comes with the, you know, the question of, you know, you, you open up a sports books, you know, app here. Let's say I'm in Nevada and I download an app and I, I open it and I see they have lines on, you know, 100 different games today and they've got, you know, spreads and, and, and money lines and totals. And maybe they've got some props on some games. They've got in, in-game bets on some games. You know, and, and the question is, where, does those, where do those lines come from? I mean, who, who makes those numbers? You know, who says, you know, Iona should be minus six and a half and not minus eight or, you know, plus six and a half or, or whatever. So and, and so that chapter is, is meant to answer that question. And, and, the, and the answer is that sports books get their lines from three different sources, essentially, a, a combination of three different sources. You know, and the first source is from we call them super nerds in the book, but basically people who have built some sort of model that 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 is attempts, you know, mathematically using data and, and intuition and logic to come up with a, a best guess estimate for what the line should be. And then the two other processes, which are really the more powerful processes, certainly for pregame lines, are uh, price discovery and uh, copying, <laughs> really copying from other books. And, and so the way price discovery works is that when uh, a sports book you know, basically they take a bet and then they move the line. So if, if, if you know, a sports book has Iona minus six and a half, and then, you know, I bet a, a max bet on Iona minus six and a half, well, maybe they'll move the line to minus seven for the next, you know, for the next customer. And so that price discovery process where that take a bet, move a line process is what we call the market making process. And then there's, there's basically a copying process where not every bookmaker is going to have a good, you, you know, in, in order to be a market maker for a market, you need to have a kind of a critical mass of customers who are willing to bet the markets. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to come up with a good price. And if you only have one or two customers who are going to bet something, then it's impossible to come up with a good price that way. And the example we give here is, let's say in Las Vegas, someone wants to offer a line on Australian rules football. Well, because there's, you know, some some, you know, visitors from Australia here in Nevada um, and they want to bet on their game. Well, it doesn't make sense for a Nevada sports book to try to make a market the way I described, because there's only there's only two or three people who want to bet the game here. And there's no way to come up with a price intelligently with, you know, two or three customers. So what they do, what do they do? They look at a sports book, maybe one that's based in Australia that gets a lot more action on the game and they they just copy the line and they say okay well it says adelaide should be you know minus five well let's just put up adelaide minus five and if anyone wants to bet at our book they can they can bet either side at the adelaide minus five and so that's the copying process and 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 that makes sense in some circumstances for some sports for some books and 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 the price discovery process makes sense uh, in some markets for some books. And, and, and really all the lines get made as, as kind of a combination of, of both of those processes. Um, and some books rely more on the market making process. Some books rely more on the copying process. And, and that's kind of how the lines get made. So that's the distinction we draw is that market making books will tend to uh, use price discovery more and rely on, on kind of looking at the market is what people call it or copying or whatever you want to call it less. And, and, and the retail sports books are um, kind of the opposite and they rely a little bit more on, on copying uh, the, the sports books that have, you know, done the price discovery work have made the markets and, and they're trying to offer bets to their customer set, you know, at reasonable lines. And then uh, along with that kind of the, I mean, every every page in the book is is as um, as important as the next. Um, I mean, understanding the way the market works is obviously one thing, and the the second thing that jumped out to me is kind of your strategy or technique to to beat the market and what you've you've already alluded to and what you refer to in the book as synthetic hold. Um, now, I kind of the, the book makes it very clear how that works, but I'd like to know: is that something that you were putting into practice, and if so? kind of how many legitimate betting opportunities were you finding and, and how profitable was it? Instead of saying, oh, I have a model, my model's great, 
let me just compare my model's output or, or whatever. You say you don't have a model. Let me just look at, you know, lines and decide which lines I think are off and bet the off line. You know, that's kind of the, the quote unquote standard process that a lot of people bring to sports betting. And, and, and frankly, I don't think that process is very profitable for most people. Um, and the reason I don't think it's profitable is because that process is really, you know, has you betting into uh, holds a lot of the time. It has you basically making bets into, you know, three, four, five percent holds from the sports book. And, and in, I, I kind of run down in the book. We do the math on, you know, how right you have to be if you want to bet into a market, let's say, that has a four percent hold and you want to make a lot of bets into that market. I mean, you have to be right, and by right, I mean your your model or your process has to pick the right side, quote unquote. You know, really, a, an overwhelming majority of the time, if you even want to break even, you know, betting into a, a hold like that. And again, the book kind of breaks that down about why that's true. So, the, I think if you want to win at sports betting, I think the most critical concept is this synthetic hold concept, which says, well, I don't want to bet into a four percent hold; I want to bet into a zero percent hold. And so what does that mean? Well, no bookmaker, no single bookmaker is going to offer you a 0% hold. But from the better's perspective, it's identical if you can take two bookmakers and they have, you know, their prices are sufficiently different such that they're offering, you know, one sports book is offering minus 150 on team A and the other sports book is offering plus 150 on team B. Well, from your perspective, that's exactly the same as if one sports book offered minus 150 plus 150 on that market. In other words, that they have 0% hold on the market. You know, if you're betting into a 0% hold market, if you flip a coin, you're not going to lose. There's no hold in the market. There's no, you know, flipping a coin is a, is a break even activity at that point. So, so kind of the, 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 the process we suggest in the book is don't start with your model. Don't start with looking at the lines and figuring out what's wrong. Start by comparing lines at other bookmakers See which ones where you can get that market hold down to essentially zero. Sometimes it won't be exactly zero. Sometimes it'll be, you know, 0.2%, 0.3%, but, but small numbers. And, um, and then pick your bets, you know, because if you're, if you're choosing bets, even if your process isn't that great, if you're just like kind of good at picking good bets, well, if you're kind of good at picking good bets that have 0% hold, you're, you're now making money. So so that's the idea. I think it's an extremely powerful idea. I really don't think you can you can win much at sports betting without using that idea extensively, um, honestly. And and you know it. And as I say, with the in play betting, because my focus again has been in play for the last few years. Um, I mean, those those opportunities are absolutely rampant because of the way in play betting works. Because of the way. Um, you know, different, different operators put up their in-play lines, you know, there's not this time the, the, there's basically no time for copying. So, um, it, or, or there's not much time for copying. There's much less copying and there's much more, you know, put something up, take a bet, pull it down, move on to the next one. And, and, and that kind of quick dynamic creates just, just tons of opportunities where you can create zero hold markets during the game. And then, you know, again, if you have any insight at all, then then you can win in those markets. And then of all the of all the things that kind of the the book touched upon and the 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 betting concepts and ideas that came out of it, there were obviously some some things that were omitted that a lot of people reading the book might have kind of expected or are aware of. And um, so things like and you you do touch upon it at the end. I think you say about like staking methods or, or bankroll management and variance. So. Was the intention there to maybe including those things kind of removes the simplicity of it, or is it just kind of keeping the book short? Is there a reason that they were kind of omitted? I try to write what I think is I have useful things to say, and you know that's beyond what kind of is already out there, you know, and you know, and and, and yeah, and I want to keep the book simple. I don't want to write on and on and on. No one wants to read a book that's you know, 600 pages about sports betting. And I don't want to write a book that's 600 pages about sports betting. So I try to stick to, you know, the things that I have to say that are maybe a little bit different or where I think I can offer clarity or something extra beyond what else is out there. You know, I don't write in a vacuum. You know, I write, you know, every, there's a whole, there's already a whole library of books about sports betting. There's 
tons of sports betting content on the internet, you know, on Twitter and, and, and all this stuff. And, and because I don't write in a vacuum, I, I want my writing to add to what's out there. And, you know, I don't, I don't know that I have anything interesting to say about bankroll management that hasn't already been said, I guess is, is what I would say. I mean, I mean, I have my thoughts. I definitely have some disagreements, minor disagreements with certain what, what I see out there. I, but to me, it's not, it wasn't an area where I felt like I could really write something great that, that people would get a lot out of. So I just didn't. And then right at the end, you kind of get to this bit about winning and you kind of make that important point about on average or, or in the long run um, and kind of how you, you measure success and things like that. I'd just be interested to, from your kind of perspective and talking about like efficient market hypothesis and, and things like that is, do you view the closing line as kind of a, a, legit, a legitimate method to, to measure success? I, I think, well, certainly for pregame uh, betting, I think, I think certainly that that's an extremely important metric. You know, you look at um, the bets that you made, especially if you made them substantially before the market closed, and then you uh, look at the closing line. And if you are getting bets that are better and, and would be unavailable at the closing, that's certainly a good sign. That's especially important if, if you aren't moving lines yourself and or if, you know, that there's there's some caveats to it, but it's that's an extremely, you know, important measure of, you know, value, so to speak. The the problem with this, and this is really the problem with all gambling, you know, except maybe I would say, you know, things like, and even with things like blackjack and video poker, where there's, you know, fixed, you know, fixed probabilities and fixed outcomes, but, but certainly with poker, right. I, I've been in the poker world for a long time. I, I played poker for a living for, for, for years. And then, and then I wrote a lot of books about poker and I've talked about poker a lot. And, and, and the one question people always ask is, well, how do I know if I'm a winning player, you know, at poker? And, and my answer is, well, you don't, <laughs> or you do. I mean, it, you know, I, you know, and they say, well, I've played, you know, I've played 160 hours and I'm up, you know, $734 in my winning player. And I, I say, no, you're not. You know, and, and the reason is because that's that's too short a sample to just look at results and to know that you're a winning player. The other reason is that the game is constantly changing. And so, so you know, just because you've won in the past 174 hours, really, really in a, in a, in a, in a sort of profound way does not say how you're going to do over the, in the future, especially, you know, far into the future. Um, and I think the same is true for sports betting. And, and so for poker, I always tell people, like, you know you're winning if you know it. You know what I mean? And, and, and this is a little fuzzy because obviously people's egos can get in the way of this and people's you know, emotions can get in the way. And if they really don't understand gambling, they may think they're winning and they're not. And, and, and honestly, if that's the way you are, there's nothing I can do for you. Um, but for me in, in poker, you know, it was always, you know, if I had an edge, I knew it. You know, if, if, if I was doing things that were going to create, you know, a sustainable long-term advantage for me, I knew it. I knew what I was doing. I knew what my opponents were doing. I knew what the problem was with what they were doing. And I knew how, what I was doing was going to take advantage of it. And I could do the math and I could say, this is, this is what they're doing. This is what I'm doing in response. This is why it wins, you know? And, and, and if I just, do enough of those things. If I have enough of those moments in my, you know, poker playing career, well, I'm, I'm going to win. I, and I know I'm going to win and I don't have to worry about, you know, whether I have won over the last, you know, 300 hours or, or whatever, you know, it's, it's more in terms of, you know, how, how specifically can I articulate what my advantage is in the game and how often do I get into those situations? And then, you know, if I'm in a poker game where I'm not winning, you know, to be honest, I know that too. I, I you know, if you're in a poker game where, where maybe you're not the best player or, or you don't have an edge, you know, guess what? You end up in a lot of situations where you don't know what to do, you know, and, and, and you don't get in a lot of situations where you know hard, you know, where you're like, man, I've got an edge right here. I know it, you know. It, everything starts to get a lot more fuzzy and you start to, you know, really saying, well, did that work out or not? I don't know. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> and, and the more you're thinking like that, well, guess what? The more the rake's going to eat you, the more, you know, the fact that these are ultimately, you know, that, 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 that there's a, you know, a negative bias to all of your results 
is going to is going to eat you. And I feel like it's exactly the same with sports betting. You know, I, I feel like, you know, if, 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 if you are doing things where you can articulate and you can say, well, I have an advantage. Of course, I have an advantage. I just bet, you know, I just bet into a scalp. I just bet into 17 scalps. Of course, I have an advantage, you know, and by betting into a scalp, I don't mean necessarily betting both sides. I don't think you have to do that. But like, you know, if you can point, you could say, look, I got I mean, look what I bet into, you know, <laughs> how could I not have an advantage? Well, that's that's one thing. If 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 you're depending on, you know, your model being better than an entire market's worth of people, well, you know, and and that's the only thing you have have to hang your hat on, you know, I I I don't think you know really whether you're winning or not and you're you're probably not. You know, so so to me that's to me that's the answer always with these questions of, you know, am I winning? How do I know? you know, it's, it's kind of, you know it, if you know it, and, and if you don't know it, you probably aren't, you know, and, and that's kind of my answer. Yeah. I think if, if that day comes that you do want to write your, your 600 page book, you can, you can choose skill versus luck as, as your subject matter. I mean, is it Nate Silver that suggested kind of a hundred thousand hands in poker? And I mean, sports betting is really anyone's guess when it comes to sample size. It's absolutely nuts how long you, how 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 the how the variance is, and you can kind of do the math on it. You can run sims, and you can kind of say, "Oh, look, that could happen." But I mean, you know, I mean, I have, you know, I I now have, you know, a better part of a twenty year history of gambling. I I've played certainly a lot of poker, you know, and and definitely done a lot of, you know, and I mean, it's just the the swings are crazy, and they'll drive you nuts, you know, in the middle of it. You know, you get in a downswing, and you doubt everything, and you just have to you know, go through and you could say, is what I'm doing winning? Here's what I'm doing. Is there anything I'm doing that could be not winning, you know, that could be causing this results? And then, you know, and, and it's the same on the upside. I mean, it, it's so easy to fool yourself that you've built something, you know, that's that just that, you know, that you've got a cheat code or something and that you, you can't help but win. And, you know, and you have to actually try to step back and look at it logically. And you say, am, am I creating consistent consistent edges for myself to me that's to me that's the only thing you can hang your hat on because because you know in poker and in sports betting all of this changes you know you can have an edge in sports betting you can have an edge this year and next year it can be gone because something's changed you know there's lots of things that can change the way the market works pregame can change you know in play for instance the way people make the numbers in play can change uh props can change the openers can get better i mean there's so much the game can change you know so the you know, the pace of the game or your, I mean, there's just so much that can change from year to year that you really can't ever say, well, I won it this last year. I'm going to win it this, this year too. I mean, you just can't say that. You really truly can't say that not in poker, not in sports. And, and, and so there's, you know, every single day that you do this, you have to say, you know, you have to say, am I creating edges for myself? you know, and, and look at it at that level. And if the answer is yes, then keep going. And if the answer is no, then, you know, find some edges. Right, so we've, we've spoken a lot about you and, and the book that you've written, and now I kind of want to touch upon the, the betting industry as a whole. And obviously, through the process of writing the book you, you've done a lot of research and you, you clearly you know how the market works and you touched upon knowing the writing was on the wall for, for DFS and the preempting almost what happened in the US so for you kind of what's your view on the the current state of the betting industry so I, I think it's in, in in what I would call an inflection point you know I think I think there's enormous you know, pent up demand for sports betting in America. I think Americans like to bet sports. We have a sports betting culture, um, you know, and, and I think a well designed sports industry in this country would be absolutely massive. And by well designed, I mean, I mean, really one that is designed for uh, to maximize the customer experience. I think the better experience the customer has you know, betting sports in the U.S., the bigger the industry will be and the more value it will create for everyone, including the customer who wants entertainment and who, who wants to bet sports. So, you know, to me, that's that's the ideal, you know, and I can tell you what I think is about customer experience. But then we have all these competing interests. 
we have the leagues, we have, you know, the state governments, we have sports betting operators, we have existing land-based operators, we have Native Americans, we have, uh, you know, there's just a lot of competing interests in this country. And, you know, and their interests are to, you know, kind of get the most for themselves, honestly, you know, and, and, you know, they're not, they're, which is perfectly reasonable. I mean, that's, that's how the world works. And, you know, and they're not necessarily taking this kind of bigger picture view of, well, if we focus on customer experience, we'll grow the pie for everyone, which I truly believe, um, you know, and so, so I think the inflection point is how much, how much do the, do the compromises and all the fights and, and, and all the negotiations between all the competing interests, how much do those end up damaging the customer experience, you know, necessarily by, you know, if I get what I want, well, that means the customer's not going to get what they want. And, and to the extent that those compromises are being made um, is going to kind of chip away at the ceiling of, of what the industry could be. And, and if it, if the too many of those compromises are made, really the industry is, 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 is going to be DOA. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's so much of an inflection point that it could be an absolutely massive industry, or we could be reading articles in three years about how, what a disappointment it is. Um, and, you know, and, and I think what it comes down to is it comes down to building it right, building it right with a long-term view from legislators, building, building sensible uh, regulation and fee structures. I think it comes right to, you know, the leagues focusing on, you know, what their long-term goals are and, and, and what really provides them value over the long-term. Uh, I think it comes down to, you know, everybody kind of realizing that, that the more, the more they, you know, the more they allow kind of a, a thriving market to build, the more everyone's going to make from it. And yeah. And so this is what I'm hoping for. And, and, and honestly, I've seen, you know, reasons to be optimistic about that. I've definitely seen reasons to be optimistic about that. And then I've seen, you know, some reasons <laughs> to be not optimistic about that. And I think it's going to, I, I'm still optimistic overall. I think what's going to happen is that I think we need a critical mass of states and people who are in it to do it the right way. And, you know, and then the people who kind of don't do it the right way will, will get the results, the, you know, the poor results from that. And we'll see the ones that are thriving. And, and, and I think we'll make adjustments. I mean, that's, that's what I hope will happen. And, and I'm still optimistic that's what's going to happen. When you say kind of customer experience, are you referring to the ex levels of accessibility or are you kind of talking about the odds that are available to customers, the limits that they can bet with? Uh, so I'm talking about um, so I'm talking about a bunch of things. I'm talking about, um, you know, everything from, you know, pure user experience. Is it is it is it is it fun and accessible? Is it easy to deposit? Is it is the app nice to use? Do the things click, you know, whatever, all that stuff. You know, is it slick? Is it well built? To um, what products are available? Do are there markets for people to bet on that are fun and interesting, or are they dry and stale and everything is a you know poorly presented? And so I would call that like the menu, the betting menu. So I think you know, in interesting, well created, well designed betting menus and innovative games, I think you know are a huge part of the customer experience. I think. Uh, and then, yes, I think um, I think price is a big deal. I think I think if um, the price is too high, you know, there's there's no amount of you, you can't compensate for that in the end. I mean, if you if you beat people too quickly, it just isn't fun no matter what. So uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's possible to build a sustainable betting product when the holds are seven, eight, nine, ten percent, you know, on on every on every click. You know, it's just that, that, that and, and this is subjective. I don't, I don't know what the magic number is, but, but you know, there's, if you gamble, there's just a subjective difference between gambling into a, you know, let's say a one or 2% hold situation, you know, and I, anyway, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but versus like an eight to 10%. I mean, if you're betting 50, 50 bets where you're going to, you know, win, you know, even money on your bet and you're betting into 10% hold, I mean, you just lose and lose and lose. It's just not fun. And so, you know, it, and so people just quit. I mean, it's just you can't keep people's attention to bet 50-50 propositions in the 10% hold for too long. They'll just stop doing it. So it's, it's 
you know, so price, I, I think limits are important too. You know, I think letting people bet what they want, I think, I think limits are mostly important to a few people, but I think those few people, it matters a lot too. And I think that could make a pretty substantial difference in the bottom line. And then, and then the biggest thing that I think is important is I think the fairness to me, that's the number one thing I kind of buried the lead here because I think that's the most important, you know, factor of customer experience is that the customer sees the betting experience and sees their interaction with a sports betting operator or a contest or whatever it is as fundamentally fair, you know, and to, and to me, what that means is that means um, eliminating uh, the betting delays that a lot of operators have where they, you know, you click your bet in and then they sit on it for eight seconds and then you get a message that says rejected. The line has moved. Would you like the new line? You know, and, and, and I know, I mean, not only from my own personal experience, but from talking to people, I mean, people understand that that that's, you know, that basically they're getting screwed when that happens, you know, and, 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 you know, the more, the more the product is built around that concept, the delay concept, we're going to delay you, we're going to offer you, you know, um, it, it, I mean, really the delay, the, the, you know, and, and, and bet rejections and so forth, um, the, the more people are not going to want to bet. I mean, it's just not a good product. The good product, the, the idealized product, let's talk about the idealized product from the, the consumer's perspective. The idealized product is I can deposit money or I can play for free, um, whatever I want. I can, to, to, to bet, I can bet on my computer or, or really I can bet on a mobile device. I can bet on my phone. Or I can bet in person at a game, at a counter. I can bet how I want. Um, if I bet on my phone, the app is easy to use. It's easy to navigate. I can get quickly to the things that are going to interest me. If I want to bet on a game, let's say I want to bet in play, I open the game. The menu presents me immediately with interesting, fun propositions to bet on. You know, I, I don't have to dig through a, a, a huge menu to find something I want to bet. You know, I'm, I'm presented with interesting options. Um, that remain interesting throughout the game, I can bet those options, you know, essentially through the end of the game. So if it's, you know, late in the fourth quarter and the game's tied, I don't open up the app and all the markets are suspended. <laughs> I can actually bet, you know, on who's going to win this thrilling game. Um, you know, and then what does it look like? The hold is reasonable so that when I bet, you know, I'm, I'm a recreational better. No, I'm probably not going to be picking well against the, you know, you know, with, with some major advantage. So, you know, I, I have a chance to win because the hold is not prohibitive, but most importantly, when I select the bet that I want, I click the bet, I put in the amount I want, I hit go. And it says, congratulations, you, you've got a bet, you know, I mean, to me, that's the customer experience. And, 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 you know, if the customer consistently gets that experience where, you know, everything is smooth from beginning to end and everything is exactly what they expect it to be, I mean, that's the product to me and, and that's how it should work. And, and, you know, it doesn't work that way because it's hard. It's hard from the operator side to offer that product. But to me, you know, to me, the closer we get to that ideal, the, you know, the more this is going to succeed and, and, and the people who put in the work and the effort to try to make that customer experience happen are, are going to be the ones who are successful. So, you know, that's what I mean when I talk about customer experience. And then I guess kind of from a European listeners will probably think some of those things you mentioned there, they European sports books tick a lot of those boxes. They have the, the mobile apps, the online offering, the, the extensive range of, of markets and things like that, but they're perhaps missing that, that fairness element or they've got that 8% hold that you kind of touched upon. So for you, would it kind of be a case of if that product could come and then work on the other side of it, work on reducing that hold and the delays and things like that, would you take that as kind of a, a compromise or is it all or nothing? No, it's, I mean, it's never all or nothing. I mean, and, 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 you know, I, I mean, I don't have, you know, I'm, I'm just one guy. I'm not, you know, this is just my vision of, you know, the idealized how it should work. But, you know, to me, yeah, I agree with you about the European products. I agree that they tick some of those boxes and that they, they, they really don't tick some of the boxes. And, and, and I think especially in the United States, that fair, fairness element is really going to matter. It's, it's, I think it's, it's ingrained in the culture here. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I don't want to talk about caricatures, but, you know, we're the land of cowboys and we're the land of freedom and, you know, and hot dogs and whatever. And, and you know, it's, it's, 
and, and I just know I, I've been in this country, you know, gambling in this country for 20 years. I know how important that fairness aspect is to people. And they'll gamble with you all day long if they think a bet is a bet and, and that you're, you're not trying to get one over on. And, you know, and, and so I just know how important that piece is here. And, 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 and I think, I think any European operator who wants to do business in the United States should, should take extremely seriously that aspect of it. And I think if they don't, you know, take it that seriously, I, I think, I, I think they're going to struggle and, and they're not necessarily going to understand why they're struggling because, you know, because they're, you know, maybe they, they'll say, well, this, this worked in, in this, in this other market that we're in, you know, you know, well, we're just going to do it here. And, and, you know, and, and I do think that that's going to be a huge differentiator for an operator here. It's also hard. I understand why they have delays. I mean, I understand what they're worried about, especially in play. You know, I think we have a solution for that. Um, at least what I think is a, is, is a strong solution, but, you know, I understand why they do business that way, but, but, you know, again, I think, I think, you know, sometimes I've talked to people in the industry and, and I think they're, they're kind of, they're, they're stuck inside their box a little bit. They're saying, well, it has to be this way because, and, and my answer is, well, it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> you know, you know, every time you're saying it has to be this way, or you can't do that, you know, every time there's a like must or can't attached to something, I, I just, you know, I, I can't help but say, well, I, I think you're missing something. I think you've got blinders on a little bit about it. So, uh, and that's the way I feel kind of about some of the European operators here. And I, and I think they'll adjust. I think, I think at least some of them will, you know, will make the necessary adaptations. And, and, and again, I'm optimistic. I, I think someone's going to build an absolutely killer product. And, and I think sports betting is going to be huge here. Right, so let's let's now look ahead to the future. And I know you've kind of reflected on the the current state of the the betting industry, and it's it's very difficult to kind of predict what might happen even even twelve months down the line. But I mean, for for you specifically, what are you up to now, and what are your kind of plans for development in the future? So, um, so Matt and I, uh, as I say, I've been writing in play betting models for the last few years. So Matt and I are are turning that those models into a company called Deck Prism Sports. Um, and, and basically, we're going to offer an in-play odds feed for American sports. So we think, and by American sports, our, our main focus is on what we consider the five major American sports, which is NFL football, college football, uh, NBA basketball, college basketball, and, uh, and Major League Baseball. Um, and, you know, in, in our view, the existing kind of in-play models and products and betting feeds are, um, they're, they for the American sports, they're they're not they're not quite sharp enough to offer the product as as I've just described. So so the killer product where there's no delays, a bet is a bet. You have your limits. You can bet throughout the game. You get interesting propositions. You know, it, in our opinion, the the current offerings are 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 not there yet to enable that that excellent customer experience. So. What Matt and I said is we said, well, we think the cust- it's all about the customer experience. Let's build that piece of infrastructure that the industry is going to need if they want to offer that, that excellent customer experience, you know. And so that's what we've set out to do with Deck Prism Sports. So we're, we're trying to offer an in-play betting feed for American sports where operators can offer it without delays and can offer it at higher limits without worrying about you know, getting, getting taken advantage of getting, getting beaten in the, in the, you know, in, in the kind of cheesy ways for lack of a better word that they're worried about getting beaten in, you know, and and that the current products, you know, kind of, you know, are vulnerable to. So, so that's, that's our concept. So am I right in thinking that these, these models that you're building, they were initially built around kind of beating the market and now they're getting repackaged to to serve the market to kind of help customers get better offerings yeah i mean that's that i would say that's the history of it i mean when we started in 2015 or yeah we started in 2015 uh you know building these models i mean we we did not have deck prism sports in mind as the as the end product of these models we didn't really know exactly you know what the end end product would be but yeah i mean they were definitely built you know with the idea of well let's 
let's, you know, build something that can beat the market, you know, the markets that exist. And, um, you know, we did. I, I think what we built is extremely successful in that end and, um, you know, in, in multiple sports. And, yeah, and, and you know, and, and, then, and then we said, you know, well, should we, you know, how now what should we do with this? Now that we've built it, what's the best way to use it? Um, what's the most valuable way to use it? What's the way to take what we've built and, you know, kind of, I mean, give it the most value. And, and, and to be honest, I don't think that's, you know, using it to try to beat operators at, you know, at their in-play betting markets because, you know, operators don't want to get beaten at their in-play betting markets to be quite frank about it. And, you know, they'll, they'll limit or they'll, you know, or they, or they won't offer the in-play market at all. I mean, that's, that's the other option is if we try to, you know, try to beat people at scale with our in-play betting model, well, they'll just cut limits and stop offering the product, you know, at some point. So, you know, it, to me, that's not, that's, that's not a, a really a constructive way to use, to use what we've built, you know, at least that's not, you know, the most constructive way. So I think, yeah, what, what we want to do is we want to help build a better product for the new U.S. sports betting industry. We want to be a key part of that. And we think that's the most valuable way to use what we build. And those, those sports that you selected, I know you kind of touch upon in the book about some being built for, for the model or those in-play markets due to the timeouts and things like that. But was your intention then, did you pick those because you knew you could serve the American market with that or was it because they were easier to model? More the first. I mean, I mean, those are the American sports. Those are we're Americans. Those are the sports we've grown up with. I mean, those are the most popular sports in the U.S. Those five for sure. I mean, those are the most popular leagues. That's what I grew up watching as a kid. All those five leagues and and Matt too. And you know, that's what we know. I mean, I I I wouldn't you know I wouldn't really try to model Australian rules football. I've seen three games in my life, you know. And, and, you know, I've watched more soccer than that, but I'm, you know, not the expert on it that, that, you know, many people who, you know, grew up in, in Britain and have been w- watching the game their whole lives would be. So the, to, to me, it's kind of been a natural fit. And, and it's also, in my opinion, what the underserved, what's, what's kind of underserved and underbuilt a little bit. Um, so yeah, to me, it was a natural fit to, to kind of pursue those sports at least first. And, um, I think, uh, you know, it, and, and, and I do think it's important, you know, as you said about the timeouts, and, and this is our solution, uh, our main solution for the delay problem is that, is that you know, operators are, are extremely concerned about court siding, you know, and, and are very worried about someone at the game with, a, with, with fast information. Now, I think that's a little bit less of a concern um, today than maybe it has been in the past because, you know, data feeds are getting much faster and, you know, it's possible to, to put up lines that are based on information that's, you know, really only a second or two old. But, you know, notwithstanding that, um, you know, the timeout offers a perfect opportunity for a, an equality of information between the customer and the operator. And to me, that's the key point, because, again, our focus is on the customer experience. We want the customer to have a fair, good quality betting experience. And, and you know, okay, well, if the operator's up to the second, well, guess what? The customer's not because they're watching on TV and the TV's 15 seconds behind. So, you know, the, the, the betting at the timeout as a model is, is what, in our opinion, best serves the customer experience because, okay, the game goes to timeout. They know exactly what the score is. They've been watching. They can open their betting app and they have, guess what, exactly the same information that the sports betting operator has when they've made their market. And so they can go into that with the equality of information. They can bet into markets with reasonable holds and, you know, and they, they, they can do okay and, and they can have fun doing it. And so, so that's why our focus has been on the timeouts because we think that's really a premium opportunity for these sports and, and, and all American, all the major American sports have it. So why not use those timeouts and, and, and create those and, and kind of, create those as the center of the in-play betting experience for the American customer. And if we just go back to that contrast we had about sports books in the States and kind of elsewhere around the world, I mean, I know 
some bookmakers, Europe, wherever it might be, they've they've kind of quoted crazy splits of in-play markets and pre-game markets and where their where their volume is landing. Now I'm guessing that's not the case in America. And do you think a product like what you're selling will address that and change that? Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's I I think a hundred percent. You know, I I've heard a lot of theories about. So what you're referring to is the in-play you know, is 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 eighty percent or more of the volume in, in some European markets or other markets. And in the US it's it's less. People talk about more like forty percent, you know, fifty percent, you know, and and yeah, I mean my opinion is that the number one thing, you know, people talk about, oh well it's a pregame betting culture in the US. People are used to betting parlays and pregame. And and that's true. I, I don't discount that, but I don't see anything about the US betting culture that would preclude Americans from embracing in-play betting. I mean, Americans are 100% going to want to watch the game and make bets during the game. You know, I do 100% see the fairness issue as a barrier to adoption. I think I think it's a if you build it, they will come situation where if you build the good, compelling in-play product, if you build the product that's fun, that has reasonable holds, that has no delays, and doesn't free roll you on information so that the customer gets a fair betting experience, I think Americans are going to absolutely love it. And, and I think it's going to go nuts. That's, that's my opinion. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe we build this product and, and people start, start, you know, you know, sports books start offering it and, and it goes over like, uh, you know, a sack of rocks and everyone says, you know what, I actually have no interest in betting once the game starts. I mean, I mean, maybe I, I think that's extremely unlikely. I, I, I for sure think that the barrier to adoption here has to do with the quality of the product from the customer experience angle. So away from, from Deck Prism Sports and, and sports betting in general, what does life look like for you now? Is it, are, you, are you playing poker? Have you got any more books on the agenda? Um, no and no. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I, so I have a family, so I spend a lot of time with my family. Um, and pretty much all my other time I've spent you know, trying to build this business. This is a startup business and it's, it takes a lot of work for sure. And, and, you know, we're, we're, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, I'm mostly work and then I go home and I'm a dad and then I go to sleep and I wake up and work and then I'm a dad and, you know, I'm going to do that until, you know, for the foreseeable future, for sure. Well, Ed, I was really looking forward to you coming on. And I mean, you certainly haven't disappointed. I loved the book and it was it was a pleasure to talk to you about it as well as some great discussion on, on betting in general. So thanks for taking the time out to come on and chat. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Ben. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Ed is on Twitter, so you can follow him on at Ed Miller Poker. And I strongly suggest anyone out there who hasn't read the book goes out and buys it on Amazon. As always, if you want to learn more about betting, then head to pinnacle.com forward slash betting resources or follow at Pinnacle Sports on Twitter. Thanks for listening and bye for now.